Bruchem Aboim. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for attending, and again, welcome to our home. Uh, it's good to be back after a two-week hiatus. Um, so this week's lecture will be a actually a double lecture, uh, this week and next week. And it'll deal with, again, what's on the calendar, the month of Elul, the 30 days before Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. Again, a very special time of the year. Uh, again, so the lecture this week is on the month of Elul. Well, the month of Elul is here again. The month that we, when we place much more emphasis on tshuva, repentance, and retrospection. So, so how did your year go? Does it feel like it wasn't that long ago that you observed this month? If so, then you probably had a, a pretty good year. When things are going well, somehow time just seems to fly. On the other hand, if you feel like this whole season happened a long time ago, hmm, then you probably had a tough year when things are difficult in our lives. It seems that the clock doesn't seem to move at all. So it would seem that things being what they are, reality does not always dictate how your life is going, more often than not. It is a matter of perception. How do you perceive your life? your perception more than reality is many times what decides on how your year really was. Uh, what if your year was great and you were super successful? Does that mean that you're doing everything right in God's eyes? After all, it would seem that, after all, he's rewarding you. And what if he had a tough year? Money, health, children. Does that mean that God has given up on you and that he no longer loves you or cares? Or could it be that the side of evil, hmm, the devil, is blinding you with success, making you feel arrogant and overconfident? The question we have to ask is, has he bought you? Has he made you a slave in a gilded cage? Has he convinced you that you are a self-made man and that you should worship your creator? If you experience a year of pain and suffering, is it a punishment? Or is it a wake-up call from a benevolent father who cares deeply? You learn nothing, nothing from success, but you learn a whole lot from failure. Success can make a person complacent, living in the past, content with yesterday's achievements. Failure, hmm. Failure forces a person to grow, to learn humility, to hustle. Also, to appreciate all that one has attained in gratitude to all of those who have been instrumental and helping you to achieve your success. You know, there's a saying that goes, good judgment comes from experience, and experience comes from bad judgment. In Ju Judaism, we believe in the concept of a yurida l'tzarech a descent to reach an even greater ascent. If you want to jump as high as possible, well, the, you need, the first thing you need to do is bend down. The lower you bend, the higher you will jump. This is a time of the year for all of us to take inventory. Any business that operates on credit is required to submit a profit and loss statement to the bank. They do that in the hope that the bank will be willing to extend a line of credit throughout the coming year. When we take our personal inventory, when we examine all the words that we spoke and all the actions that we performed throughout the previous year, when we try to balance our good deeds, our mitzvot, against our transgressions, our averos. We may find that our credit rating is not as good as we would have hoped. Therefore, we turn to God Almighty on three separate levels. We turn to him first as a husband. We know that when God gave the Torah to the Jewish nation at Mount Sinai, God, so to speak, married the children of Israel. We see an allusion to this union in the acronym for the name of the Jewish month of Elul. In the verse in Shir HaShirim, it states, Ani Lidodi Vidodi Li, which translates to mean, I am to my beloved and my beloved is to me. This verse expresses the deepest feelings that exist in a loving relationship between a husband and a wife. According to Torah law, a husband is obligated to support and care for his wife. That being the case, we ask God, our husband, to fulfill his Torah obligation we ask him to bless us with another year filled with good. Then we turn him second as a king. 
we say to him that the month of El is a time when the king is, so to speak, in the field. And there's a famous story that tells us about the meaning of this concept of the king in the field. So they tell a story about a king who was out on a hunt. It happened that he spied a magnificent buck. And without thinking, he spurred his horse and took out, took off after the buck. In his excitement, he didn't realize that he had separated himself from the hunting party. He was now on his own. His only thought was to catch the buck. He chased it and it just ran deeper and deeper into the forest. The deeper he rode into the forest, the darker it became. Soon, he lost sight of the buck. That was when he realized <laughs> that he was alone and lost in the forest. It was already late in the day and the sun was beginning to in its descent. He was hungry and thirsty, and luckily he found a fresh stream of water. So he dismounted, and both he and his horse refreshed himself with his cool water. Well, their serenity was interrupted when they heard the roar of a bear that was charging at them from out of the forest. In a panic, both he and his horse began to run, both in different directions. Fortunately for the king, the bear took off after the horse. But the king just kept running deeper and deeper into the forest. He had no idea where he was or how he was going to get out of the forest. He just kept running. Well, he was exhausted and the sun was setting and the king was wandering aimlessly throughout the brush. He had no idea which direction he should take and so he just kept walking, hoping that somehow he would find his way out. He was uncertain about his fate. He was hungry, tired, and just a bit concerned. The sun had disappeared from the horizon and was beginning to get dark. Around him he could hear the sounds of animals moving about in the forest. He had no idea of what he was going to do. He just kept walking. Well, suddenly he, he reached a clearing and there he saw a light coming from a woodsman's hut. And now he had some hope. He walked up the porch of the small hut and, hut and knocked. A simple woodsman answered the door. <laughs> The look on his face said it all. Standing in front of him was the king. The king in the flesh, yes. His royal garments were torn and he looked weary, but it was the king. So the woodman was confused. He, of course, had to invite the king into a small hut. But it was a woodsman's hut, not a palace. What was he supposed to do with the king in his simple hut? Well, he bowed his head and graciously invited the king into his home as warmly as he could. He could see the king was tired and he wanted to offer the king a place to sit. But all he had was a rickety makeshift chair, which was made up of some pieces of wood that he had just nailed together. The woodsman apologized to the king for the condition of the chair, but he asked the king if he wanted to sit. The king managed a weak smile, nodded, and he sat down. The woodsman then turned to the king and said, Your Highness, I'm sure that you are thirsty and hungry, but all I can offer you is goat's milk and a wooden cup that isn't so clean and some moldy bread. The king smiled again and said to the woodsman, you know, that goat's milk and a not so clean cup and some moldy bread would be just fine. The woodsman watched sadly as the king ate the bread and drank the milk. He wished that he had given the king a better meal, but that was all he had. The woodsman could see that the king was totally exhausted from his day in the forest. He would have preferred to offer the king a bed to sleep on, but all that he could manage was boards, straw, and rags. So apologizing to the king, he again said, I'm sure the king is very tired after your difficult day in the forest, and that you would like to get some rest. I know that the king sleeps on only the finest linens, goose down comforters, and pillows covered in silk. But all that I can offer you is wooden boards covered with straw and rags. The king smiled and said that boards covered with straw and rags would be just fine. So the woodsman arranged the bed for the king as best as he could. And within minutes, the king was snoring away. Somehow, hearing the king in his deep sleep made the woodsman feel just a little bit better. Well, the next morning, the woodsman escorted the king to the edge of the forest, and as you can imagine, there were search parties everywhere trying to locate the king. When they saw the woodsman and the king, they quickly took the king and immediately returned him back to his palace. 
Of course, the woodsman was totally ignored, which was fine with him. He quietly retraced his steps and returned back to his hut in the woods. Early the next morning, the serenity of the forest was broken by the sound of a magnificent carriage led by six horses. It was accompanied with a squad of soldiers. The woodsman, hearing all the commotion, looked out his window. There he saw the carriage and the soldiers stationed outside his hut. There was a knock at his, at his door. When he opened the door, standing in front of him was the captain of the guard and all his regalia. The captain said to the woodsman that he had been sent by the king to bring him to the palace immediately. The woodman shook his head, as if to say that he understood why the king had sent his soldiers to bring him back to the palace. After all, look what he had done. He had made the king sit on a rickety wooden chair. He had fed him goat's milk in a dirty wooden cup and moldy bread. And to make matters even worse, he had made the king sleep on board straw and rags. He was being brought before the king to be punished, as was proper, for the irreverence that he had shown to the king. He was ushered into the throne room where the king and all of his majesty was sitting on his throne. The woodsman bowed his head and waited to hear his fate. To his amazement, he looked up, and there was the king walking towards him with his arms extended and a large, warm smile on his face. The king hugged the woodsman and began to thank him for all the kindness that he had extended to him. The king then told the woodsman that he was welcome to live in the palace with the king as his reward for the rest of his life. You know, we have a tradition that starting with the Hebrew month of Elul, our king, God Almighty himself, is, so to speak, in the field, which means that he is not in his palace, nor is he sitting on his throne, places where it would be difficult to speak to him. During the month of Elul, God is out and amongst the people, very approachable. This can be compared to a candidate who's running for public office, or even a sitting president who is campaigning for re-election. He is out and about amongst the voters. He wants to shake your hand even more than you want to shake his. You know, my father once shook President Reagan's hand while he was campaigning for the presidency. As much as my father wanted to shake the president's hand, Reagan wanted to shake his. <coughs> During the year, we can only elevate those prayers that originate from the depths of our hearts and souls. Sadly, the reality is that not all of our prayers are pristine enough to be accepted by the heavenly angels. They are the ones that examine our prayers and ascertain whether they have merit and can be presented before God Almighty. However, during this period of time, when God looks at our transgressions, it is as a father rather than as a king. So that those thoughts and words that we present before him, though they may be seen as flawed, somehow, somehow during this period of time, they are now acceptable, even desired. The Torah states it is the duty of a king to help and sustain his subjects. Then third, and most of all, he is God our Father. You know, a father's job begins with the birth of his child and continues 24-7 until the father draws his last breath. The job of a parent does not end with puberty. It is not dependent upon age or maturity. As my mother, a blessed memory, would say, little children, little problems. Big children, big problems. As a husband or a king, there are rules and protocols. But as a father... There is only love and concern. A husband can divorce his wife. A king can exile or even kill his servant. However, a father, a father can never, never give up on a child. As we see with our father, our father Yitzchak, who never gave up on his son, Esau. The Talmud tells us, in fact, that we learn about the mitzvah of honoring one's parents from Esau and his relationship with his father Yitzchak. The Talmud in Shabbos states that God goes to Abram Avinu, Abraham our father, and he says to him, Your children have sinned grievously against me. Avram return, replies to God, Master of the universe, then let them be obliterated for the sanctity of your name. Then God goes to Yaakov Avinu, Jacob our father, and he says to him, Your children have sinned grievously against me. 
Yaakov replies, Master of the universe, then let them be obliterated for the sanctity of your name. Well, then God goes to Yitzhak of Enoch, Isaac, our father. And he says to him, your children have sinned grievously against me. Huh. Yitzhak then says to God, Master of the universe, my children and not yours? Huh. Then Yitzhak says to God, after all, how much could they have sinned? How many years are in a man's life? Seventy years? Take away the first twenty years, since heaven does not punish a person before that age. That leaves only fifty years. Take away twenty-five years, which are the nights. That leaves twenty-five years. Take away another twelve and a half years, which are spent praying, eating, and taking care of bodily needs. That leaves over only twelve and a half years of potential sin. If you will shoulder them all, then fine. And if not, then half should be on me, and the other half should be on you. And then Yitzhak goes even further and says to God, If you say that all of them should be on me, then I have already sacrificed myself before you when my father Abraham bound me on the altar. Then Yitzhak says to God, I too had a wayward son. What I did I, was I loved him. You should do the same. So when we turn to God during this period of time, we don't have the right to approach him with demands for ourselves. Well, we have no merit, and even if we did, we used it up a long time ago. One can only imagine that if Yaakov Avinu, if Jacob our father was fearful when he met Esau, his brother, after a 36-year separation, he was deeply concerned that maybe, maybe he had already used up all of his merits and that God would not protect him or his family. Imagine, how much more should we be concerned? So the question we have to ask is, how should we proceed? So what is tshuva, repentance? In the secular world, it would be seen as turning over a new leaf. Not so in Judaism. The Hebrew word tshuva can be broken down into two words, toshuv he, which can be translated to mean return back to God. A Jew at his very core is made up of a spark of divinity, the Pintaliyid. Every Jew is a holy vessel capable of being the dwelling place for the Shekhinah, the divinity of God. You know, there are five parts to the soul of a Jew. Three of these parts reside within a person's body. They are the nefesh, the animal part of the soul, the ruach, the intellectual part of the soul, and the neshama the spiritual part of the soul. In addition, there are two other parts that hover above the person. They are the chaya, the essence of life, and the echida, that part which is one with God Almighty himself. A person has the capability of tainting those three parts of the soul that reside within their body. But those two parts that reside outside of the body always remain pristine much like a halo. This is what allows a Jew to be able to reconnect to his Father in Heaven. That is the reason that any ten Jews, any ten Jewish men, regardless of their affiliation or religiosity, can be used for a minyan, a quorum, when praying. A person is always holy, but there are moments when his actions create a temporary separation between himself and his Father in Heaven. That feeling of separation from their Father in Heaven should be the driving force that makes a person want to do tshuva, a desire to return to the good graces of their Father in Heaven. After all, the, after all the goodness and kindness that God bestows upon us, how can we treat Him so badly by ignoring His wishes and advice? All that God desires is for us to love Him, much like any parent. As it states in the first paragraph of the Shema Yisrael, the Ahavta es Hashem Elokech, and you shall love the Lord your God. In fact, when it says, that everything is in the hands of heaven except for the fear of heaven. So what exactly is Yirat Shemayim, fear of heaven? Well, most commentaries translate Yirat Shemayim to mean that we should fear God. I find that opinion difficult and a bit reprehensible. To believe that God our Father wants us, His children, to fear Him. 
awe? Yes, but never fear. I prefer the opinion that states that Yirat Shemayim means the concern that God, as a loving Father, has for us, His children, constantly worrying and hoping that we make the right decisions. As I began this lecture, I mentioned that we do this year after year. But, that, that, but does anything really change? And one has to wonder, where do these feelings of guilt and contrition originate? The answer seems obvious, Jewish guilt. Our good side, our Yetzir Tov, wants us to be good, and so it makes us feel bad when we go against God's will. Hmm, well, maybe. I'm not so sure, though. It may well be that the driving force be behind our thoughts of tshuva, of repentance, is our evil inclination, the Sahara. You know, the Alter Rebbe, the founder of the Lubavitcher movement, based his magnus opus, the Tanya, on a verse in the portion of Nitzavim, which states, Bekar v'adav relacham ma'od b'ficha bilvavcha la'asosa, that the thing is very close to you, in your mouth, and in your heart to do. The side of evil is well aware that at our core, we are all good people. He knows that during this time of the year, we are going to experience some feelings of regret for all the transgressions that we have committed throughout the year. He also knows that if we do not talk about tshuva, repentance, and think about tshuva, hmm, then we might actually have to do tshuva. So he encourages us to think and talk about repentance. He only gets involved when we actually try to turn our thoughts and conversation into action. You know, there are health clubs that have 10,000 members, and yet they only have 300 lockers. How can that be possible? Well, try to find a close parking space at a health club on January the 1st. The parking lot is full. Try again one week later, and you can park at the front door. Many people make New Year's resolutions. They say they are going to, to work out this year. They think about it, and they talk about it. But how long do they actually keep it up? Serving God is very similar. Many times we start, but then somehow we run out of gas. You hear people say all the time that they are a good Jew in their hearts. It, it sounds very romantic, but in reality there's no substance to the statement. Imagine, if you knew someone who had a wife and children, and he tells you that he never sees his family, nor does he support them. But in his heart, he loves them dearly? Hmm, <laughs> you would think he's an idiot. Serving God must be connected to an action. On Passover, you can think about matzah all day, but until you actually put a piece of matzah in your mouth and swallow, you have done nothing, nothing but fool yourself. So just how evil is the Yetzirah? Sahara? Not only does he get us to sin, when we do, <laughs> he doesn't even let us enjoy the sin that we transgressed. He makes us feel guilty after we have sinned. In the evening prayer we say, Bechaser Satan milfaneinu miyakareinu. Removes the Satan, Satan, from before me and from behind me. What does that mean? One opinion is that initially we ask God to remove the influence of the Satan upon us so that we can perform the mitzvah. Then once we have fulfilled the mitzvah, we ask God to help us to not regret the fact that we had performed the good deed. This challenge was given to Abram Avinu, Abraham our father, after he had fulfilled the mitzvah of the Akedah, the binding of Yitzchak. His wife Sarah thought that he had killed their only son, Yitzchak. But God told Abram Avinu not to kill Yitzchak. God only wanted Avram to bring Yitzchak up to the altar, but not to sacrifice him. When Avram Avinu returned home from the Akedah, he wanted to give his wife Sarah the good news, that Yitzchak was alive and well. But he could not tell her, since he discovered that she had died, presumably due to her grief. After all, she thought that she had lost her only son. Abram Avinu could have easily regretted the mitzvah that he had performed, but he did not. This fact is indicated by the word in the beginning of the Porsche of Chayasar, where it states that he came, live kosa, to cry for her. The word is spelled with a small cuff to indicate that he did cry, but did not cry excessively. No regret. 
If the Sutton cannot get you to regret performing a mitzvah, he may take a different approach. He may try to encourage you to become overly proud and arrogant that you performed the act. Much like the story of the old man in Siberia, it was a cold winter morning and the dawn was rising in the sky. The old man was getting out of bed and his evil inclination says to him, why are you getting up so early? You're an old man, you should sleep a little longer. <clears throat> he says to his evil inclination, you're older than I am and you're up, so I guess it's time for me to get up also. He began to get dressed and his evil inclination says to him, where are you going? He answers that he's going down to the lake to go to the mikvah. His evil inclination says to him, are you crazy? You are an 80-year-old man. You know that it's the middle of the winter, the ground is covered with snow, and the lake is frozen. How are you going to go to the mikvah? The answer is evil inclination with silence. He just continues trudging through the snow. While he is making his way through the snow, his evil inclination is talking to him the whole time. It is saying to him, you're crazy, an 80-year-old man going to the mikvah in the lake in the middle of the winter? You'll kill yourself. When he reaches the frozen lake, lake, he cracks a hole in the ice and he immerses himself three times in the ice-cold water. As he is returning from immersing himself in the freezing water, his evil inclination starts talking to him again. But this time, the tone has changed. His Yetzirah is complimenting him, telling him what a tzaddik he is. His Yetzirah is saying to him, how many people would have done what you just did? You should be so proud of yourself. So initially, his evil inclination tried to stop him from going to the mikvah, a good deed. And then once he completed his mitzvah, his Yetzirah now tried to make him a Balgaiva, an arrogant person filled with pride over his accomplishment. The lesson here is that you may think that once you have fulfilled a mitzvah, that your challenge is over, that your Yetzirah has conceded. <laughs> well, think again. He is always there. He is always coming. He never gives up. We need to learn a lesson from his perseverance. The month of Elul is here, and we need to devise some game plan to be able to make this year special. Let us all take just one challenge that we face in life and make a sincere effort to correct that negative and transform it into a positive. Let us do true tshuva. And with that action, let us help to usher in the coming of Mashiach Sikainu quickly and in our time. And thank you very much for listening. Again, next week we'll continue with the second part to this idea of tshuva during this month of Elul. Again, may God thank you again for, for attending. God should bless you and yours with health and safety and happiness. Again, everything should be well in your life. God should give you all that's good. Shabbat shalom and thank you.